First up, the importance of environmental, social and governance factors, or ESG for short, in the investment process has grown in leaps and bounds in recent years. The idea that the continued commercial success of businesses is inherently tied to a sustainable economic growth path has seen as much as $13.6 trillion of assets globally managed with some consideration to these factors. Renowned ESG architect Graham Sinclair joins us from our Cape Town studio to discuss these ideas. Graham, thanks very much for your time. Let's start with Thank that proverbial it. question. Do people really take environmental sustainability issues seriously? Uh, Bronwyn, I, you know, I, I smile because yeah, there's many times that uh, you kind of wonder what are people thinking, what are they doing? But very much so in the investment space, you've seen a, a growth, an absolute growth and a relative growth in sustainable investment uh, in, in asset management in general. That growth, uh, the largest markets right now, Europe around 50, 54% of assets under management in some way have ESG factors, while in the US it's uh, in the mid 20s. Uh, where ESG factors in some way play into that asset management process. So people, yes, the average citizen, the you, the me, who are making the investments are starting to ask more questions in all parts of our lives, uh, what we buy, what we drive, where we live, uh, what happens to the water. Uh, but now we're finding more and more people asking those questions about how they invest. Graham, I'm just intrigued to know, and I guess this is the tough question, is uh, where investment managers are giving thought to these things. How, how can you sort of tell how much it's affecting the way they're thinking about investments? Has there been any research or work done on, on how the ESG component is altering or changing the behavior patterns of, of uh, investment managers around the world? Well, I think a fundamental that we begin with, Warren, is the, the investment philosophy of the shop as a whole. Look, if it's a, it's a passive quant shop, they're going to have a certain view of the world. If it's a active small cap shop, they're going to have another view of the world. Sovereigns, private equity, look at the different asset classes, and even these uh, multi-asset boutiques like uh, Omega and so on. Um, the different investment managers are going to have different approaches to how they think about what environmental, social, and corporate governance factors are going to be important to their particular asset class. So for example, fundamentally, one, one of the uh, trends we've seen and, and one of the results of the research that we've done is that the private equity asset class in Africa has nearly one in two dollars invested in some way integrating ESG factors. Now that's in a large part attribu attributable to where the demand comes from. Those assets are in large part are coming from uh, development financing institutions like CDC or PARCO or IFC. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, even your, in your real estate asset class, there's more interest about green property, about finding ways to build buildings or infrastructure, in fact, to refit infrastructure in ways that have, has, a, for example, a smaller environmental footprint. So, for example, the Empire State Building has just been retrofitted a million dollar project. Uh, Johnson Controls was one of the lead companies involved with that. Oh, well, that was a great investment opportunity for someone who perhaps had uh, uh, Johnson Controls uh, in their portfolio. Graham, just to interrupt you so there, one of the key themes at the World Economic Forum in Davos, I've just returned from that forum, was balancing short-term profits and short-term politics with long-term sustainability. Right. And whether that is actually possible, of course, in your environment, you are hoping that we are all going to be aiming for long-term sustainability. But how do we get past that short-termism short -termism when it comes to profits and politics? Yeah, that, that's a great a challenge, Bonon. Uh, uh, you know, there's a great segment after, on Saturday, there was a, a panel around uh, healthy lifestyles and obesity. You may have been there, I'm not sure if you were. Uh, and Swiss Re, uh, their representative, gave a, a, a great recap afterwards, a, kind of a three minute uh, speaking in, in the snow. Um, but the, the question you have to ask is, well, why, hang on, why is Swiss Re, as one of the major reinsurers globally, uh, uh, millions and millions of, of euros invested, or why are they interested in obesity issues? 
Well, it's part of the trade-offs of, of how, when you think about ESG issues, you see them play out uh, and, and you trade off the short to the long term. So, unfortunately, obesity, there's a whole lot of factors driving it. Yes, lifestyle chains. Yes, the pattern of how kind of you and I and, and, and Warren are, are behaving is different to perhaps our, our parents or grandparents did. But yes, there's also easy availability of food. Uh, it's at lower price points. And there's questions about how that food is marketed to us and what's in that food. So, for example, this project that Cinco has been working on called the Access to Nutrition Index, uh, and it was raised there at, at Davos last week, uh, by the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition, the Gates Foundation was there, as well as the Wellcome Trust, who funded it. Well, they began with a very simple question that said, look, how can we think about food companies and how can we encourage them to make nutrition a key part of their strategy? So that's one of those examples, I think, Brandon, where you're seeing where it's a long-term issue. Obesity is epidemic. South Africa has got the same pattern of obesity that U.S. had five years ago. I want to, I want to stay with this food theme but for a moment, Graham. I want, I want to still stay with the food theme, but move from obesity to food scarcity, which was another big theme in Davos. And yeah. the reality is that we've got some 7 billion people in the world right now, and 1 billion people globally every night go to bed hungry, 2 million children a year die of starvation. That's got to be part of the sustainability agenda when it comes to social issues. Uh, absolutely. And so two, two points I'd add to that would be there's the second piece to that index is a piece around undernutrition, right? So there's people who can afford food, maybe they're eating too much food that's got the wrong ingredients. Frankly, you can also be malnourished but obese. You could have the wrong nutrients that you're eating. But there are a whole lot of people on the planet, you, uh, you know, the number's one billion. I've seen some latest numbers that are trending just below that, about 850 million. A lot of people uh, are, are undernourished. They have too few calories in their diets. Well, how could we encourage companies as investors to think about, hey, there's a growth strategy at the bottom of the pyramid. Well, why, why don't we think about different ways of delivering the food, formulating the food, and, and getting different types of food to people who, who would happily buy it, perhaps at those price points? Yes, it could be difficult. It's I'm very passion I'm passionate about the topic, so I want to throw... Nietzsche. I'm passionate about the topic, because I want to throw one more thing in there before Warren takes over the conversation. Sure. But one of the other stats that really surprised me was that 30 to 40% of all the food that we have currently is wasted. So we actually have enough food to, yeah. to feed the 7 billion people in total, but we waste 30 to 40 percent of it. Let's, let's not take that discussion further. But uh, I know Warren wants to interject yeah. here. Graham, it's obviously the, the, the sustainability issue is a big one. And, uh, you know, without, without a bit of a prod, uh, it would be very tough to get private asset managers to incorporate that because of those factors we talk about with the short-term mentality the politics issue. Uh, what are some of the ways that, that, that uh, the ESG community, if you could call it that, is getting this into the mainstream investing process? Uh, well, my, my response, Warren, would be in, in two ways. One is that for the average asset manager, one of your key ingredients is going to be asset gathering. So if your clients are moving and if the demand is growing, and this is what the numbers are showing us, well, then you're probably going to have to build that capability, even if you hate it. Yeah? So if the GPF has a responsible investment policy and a developmental investment policy, they're outsourcing to PIC, and uh, it, it plays out down the investment value chain in South Africa. So uh, very clearly, if the market is moving, you need to develop some, some kind of capability. For example, just finished some research last year for WWF, uh, a report series called Navigating Muddy Waters. Well, what we found uh, from two years previously when we had done sim similar work looking at the market, we found most of the major institutional investment managers in South Africa had now signed on to the Code for Responsible Investment in South Africa. So that's a significant shift. Uh, even you know, names we never expected, the equivalent of the Goldman Sachs of South Africa, for example, we never expected them to be kind of thinking through this, putting stuff on their website, and really getting their head in the game. I think the second piece is, can any asset manager today, whatever their view is, try and manage in a way that assumes there's more than one planet? Or, or try to manage assets in a way that assumes there's not going to be rules and regulations and, and those are going to be enforced. Or there's a whole lot of people that are really tired of seeing their money invested in a certain way. They're looking for new ways to invest that money. There's a lot of opportunity out there. It's not just about the risks. So just to get this right, I mean, from the, from the perspective of, of an investment manager, it's, a, it's thinking about 
these, these factors that you, that you call, that you break down into, into that acronym ESG, uh, putting that into the investment process and thinking about this within the context of businesses to invest in. Uh, obviously, from your perspective, there are also a whole range of businesses that now offer uh, green energy. We've seen even General Electric with the eco-imagination uh, strategy incorporating that. I mean, are we just talking about thinking about ESG in conventional businesses or is there scope to uh, allocate money to companies that are really making an effort to, uh, to be sustainable and create sustainable products and, and services in a, in a new world economy? Mm. Uh, Warren, that's a great point. And, and this ties to, to the comment that, that Bronwyn had for us a bit earlier. Look, I, I break it down in two ways. There's sustainable investment where you integrate ESG in terms of whatever you're doing currently in your investment management process. And then there's financing sustainability or investing in sustainability. And I, and I break it out like this. Uh, Avis, for example, just purchased Zipcar in the US. Major deal. Zipcar selling hours, selling use of car, not cars. Uh, Avis, uh, classic kind of rental. So if you looked at uh, Avis, you'd say, well, hang on, why did you buy Zipcar? Well, the, the stock hadn't done particularly well, unfortunately, for those initial investors at the IPO. Perhaps it was overhyped. We've seen that happen before, right? Um, but we had a situation where Zipcar basically rethought mobility. Perhaps we don't need everyone to buy a car, service a car, insure a car, garage a car. Maybe they just want the hours to drive from here, here to there. So there's more and more mobility. Other cities are, around the world are looking at renting or, or, or buying just hours of a car versus Avis, a classic kind of rental car company. Or even you roll that back to the manufacturers of the car. Graham, I, I, I need to interrupt. Sorry, I've got, to, I've got to, Graham, I've got to keep this conversation moving, and we're running out of time. But just looking at the ESG, I want to talk about the G, the governance, governance element. Uh, can you elaborate a bit? We, we've spoken about, a lot about sustainability from an environmental perspective, sure. from a social perspective. But what about the governance issue? Is that getting enough attention? You know, it's really not. There was a shock this week, Bronner. I don't know if you saw the papers. Yeah, there was a media article about uh, um, the, the whistleblower for LeisureNet and, uh, you know, how she, she ended up not doing so great. And uh, apparently she's living with her, her child and so on. While, uh, you know, the, the people who are prosecuted for that uh, apparently have ser served their time. For me, there's two key things you need in governance in, in any organization, but particularly in listed companies. You need transparency. You need separation of powers. You need uh, uh, independent directors heading the remuneration committee, the audit committee. You need separation of, of chairman and, and CEO. Just some basics around good governance would go a long way. And something else that we flagged in our research is just how inactive South African investors are. There's so many South African investors. The majority of South African investors are not even voting, not even showing up for the AGM and voting their proxies. That has to be a real worry, and I'd, I'd love to, us to come back to that topic uh, f uh, later in the year on uh, Investment 360. You can bet your bottom dollar we'll be doing that. Graham, thanks so much for your time. Graham Sinclair from Sinclair.